Okay. Uh, hi. Uh, I guess it's about time to begin the event. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Good afternoon. Uh, for those of you in the Asian East Asian time zone uh, from Singapore and Taiwan, uh, my name is Lawrence Yang, uh, assistant professor teaching at National Yangmin Zhao Tong University here in Taiwan. Also, I'm also a research fellow at the International Center for Culture Study, also here in Taiwan. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce today's talk and speaker uh, in the last, uh, but, the, uh, the most, but one of the most important <clears throat> talk in our lecture series titled The Sino-ASEAN Infrastructure Nexus Media cultural geopolitics. Uh, it's the very last, actually, I, as a planner organizer of this lecture series, I, ha I have to say uh, the whole lecture series uh, about the Sino-ASEAN infrastructure of media geopolitics was actually in the beginning inspired by uh, the, the talk and the book of today's speaker, uh, Dr. Song Jin Li. Uh, so it, it's also, I feel particularly uh, honored this particular honor to host uh, this uh, talk and this lecture uh, at, the, at the beginning of the new year. Okay, um, before, I, uh, before I give the room for the, for the speaker, I would love to uh, briefly introduce our speaker today. Uh, uh, Dr. Song Jin Lee is an associate professor of Asian cinema at the weekend he, uh, we came we School of Communication and Information at National, oh, sorry, Nanyang Technological University. Uh, he is also the author of Cinema and the Cultural Cold War, U.S. Diplomacy and the Origins of the Asian Cinema Network, which was published by Cornell University Press uh, 2020. And uh, actually, this is also uh, where this talk is based. Uh, is about uh, the Asian Cinema Network. And I'm also happy to say that uh, because of this great value and a great historical archival work demonstrated in the book, uh, I'm happy to say that the Chinese translation of this very important book on Cold War Asian Cinema is also underway uh, in traditional Chinese. And hopefully uh, this important book could Quick, the Chinese version of it could quickly completed this year, and uh, so with that we can uh, hand it to a, a publisher review very soon. Uh, so uh, Song Jin is also the editor of Hallyu 2.0, the Korean wave in the age of social media, uh, by University of Michigan Press 2015, and rediscovering Korean cinema also by University of Michigan Press uh, 2019. And he is the, also the guest editor of a couple of other uh, special issues in film journals, uh, such as uh, reoriented, Reorienting Asian Cinema in the Age of the Chinese Film Market uh, on Screen, and the Chinese Film Industry, Emerging Debates uh, in Journal of Chinese Cinemas, also 2019, and as well as Transmedia and Asian Asian Cinema uh, on the Journal of Asian Cinema 2020. And as, as far as I know, if I'm correct, uh, uh, in addition to the current book and the book, uh, current book on Cold War uh, Cinema, uh, Professor Lee is also uh, working on a second uh, book manuscript uh, tentatively titled Border Crossings in Celluloid Asia, South Korea's encounter with uh, Sinophone cinemas. Uh, I have to say, uh, personally, I encounter, I encounter uh, Professor uh, Lee, also or Sang Jin, if I may, his work um, I mean, a, very er uh, a couple of years ago when I was trying to complete my own dissertation and trying to think about how to, during my postdoc year, trying to think about how to turn that dissertation manuscript on um, uh, co -war, uh, KMT, Chinese Nationalist Propaganda Film Media, uh, turned that manuscript into a book. And then I just encountered a couple of journal articles and uh, newly published uh, book, uh, a book and journal articles by Song Jin. And I was realized that actually what I was doing during my dissertation stage was situated within a broader and much broader and more complicated multi-layer uh, network of core media industry, which include including the circulation of finance capital, of ideology, of film technology, 
And I realized all, the, all these layers are doing the Cold War, especially on the anti-communist side, so to speak, uh, is, is actually entails a much broader work and that requires much more efforts and research. And I, and I, I was like not just in, only impressed, but also in awe by the kinds of archival and historical and archival efforts that Song Jin has been able to put together. And after I was done with uh, my postdoc work and still thinking how to turn that into a book, I was also I also noticed that uh, Song Jin almost I would say single handedly, -handedly uh, established this important. Um, sent, well, not center, but Asian Cinema Research Lab at the National, uh, <laughs> again, uh, Nanyang Technological University, NTU. Uh, for the past one or two years, uh, we have just seen the lab directly under Song Jun's efforts have uh, been holding impressive lineups of speakers, archivists, librarians, and all sorts of activities. And I think this is just uh, in terms of organizational efforts and intellectual pursuit that Song Jin's work uh, in every way has been inspiring uh, to, to me personally, and hopefully I think I've uh, been inspiring to uh, our uh, research community here uh, in Taiwan. And I look for, really look for after uh, the talk, we can talk more about other collaboration and, and, and research conversation. Uh, so without further ado, I would love to give uh, the Zoom, uh, the virtual Zoom, uh, given our condition. I really hope Sanjin could be here, but well, alas, uh, this is not possible for the for the time being in under this current pandemic. Uh, so I would love to give the virtual Zoom to Song Jin, the speaker today, uh, for our uh, book uh, lecture slash book talk today. Yeah, thank you, Song Jin. You have the floor. Oh yeah, thank thank you so much uh, for your generous introduction, Wolens. Uh, I'm flattered, and then also um, it's good to know and good to hear about um, that that my work was actually helped uh, for your research and then for uh, formulating your book your uh, book project and so on. So I'm very I'm very happy to hear, um, and also I wish I could meet uh, you in person, Lawrence, um, in, in Taiwan, and then you know give a talk and meet student and then face to face, and then we saw each other and they talk a lot about uh, lots of things and then over the uh, you know the drink and then. Uh, yeah, that's something we really want to to do. That maybe in two three years, oh, I really hope that you know face to face things will happen again. All right. Um. So I'm very pleased to introduce my book, uh, Cinema and the Culture Cold War: <laughs> uh, U.S. Diplomacy and the Origins of the Asian Cinema Network at uh, National Yang Ming Chao Tong University today. Um, by the way, let me um, share the slide first. Um, can you see the slide? Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, so if I understand correctly, uh, my lecture is, is the last one in a virtual seminar series, um, the Sino ASEAN Infrastructural Nexus Media Culture Geopolitics Online Lecture Series, right? Um, uh, according to the website, the online lecture series invite three authors, researchers based in Singapore uh, during November and December to share their recent publications and research on the media, cultural, and geopolitical infrastructures that connect the sign upon world and Southeast Asia through specific case studies on cinema industry, photography history, and diplomatic uh, strategies. And mine belongs to the cinema industry part here, I think, because I am a historian of Asian cinema, and I do um, inst institutional and industrial history of cinema. Some of you have already uh, met such esteemed scholars as uh, John Rubin and, uh, and, and Ian Chung. So I hope my lecture today doesn't disappoint you. Uh, yes, so let's begin. My book, Cinema and the Culture of Cold War, is a history of post-war Asian cinema. But I'm not telling a comprehensive story of the films, filmmakers, and cinematic movement of the region. Indeed, it is impossible to write that kind of book, and it is beyond my capacity. Instead, this study is the first book-length examination of the historical, social, cultural, 
and intellectual constitution of the first post-war Pan-Asian Cinema Network during the two decades after the Korean War armistice in July 1953. I argue that Asia's film cultures and industries were shaped by the practice of transnational collaboration and competition between newly independent and colonial state with financial and administrative support from US institutions. More specifically, this book looks at the network of motion picture executives, creative personnel, policymakers, and intellectuals in Asia at the height of the Cold War and beyond. It shows how um, they aspired to rationalize and industrialize a system of mass production by initiating a regional organization, co-hosting uh, film festivals, co-producing films, and exchanging stars, directors, and key staff to expand the market and raise the competitiveness of their product. I claim that this network was the offspring of Cold War culture politics and the US hegemony. Before I get to the core of the book, I would like to briefly overview the field. Over the past two decades, much research has been published on the clandestine psychological warfare program developed by the US government at the, hot, at the height of the Cold War. The seminal work in this area is a British journalist named Frances Stoner Saunders and her book, The Cultural Cold War, the CIA and the World of Art and Letters, which was came out in 2000. Saunders examined how the CIA funded intellectual magazines, musical performances, films, art exhibitions, and the like, to be used as weapons against the Soviet Union and its allies. For those who are curious about the influences of Saunders' work in the field of cultural Cold War studies, an Italian journal, Contemporanea, put together seven scholars in Cold War studies, including myself, and published a special dossier reframing the, the cultural Cold War 20 years after Stoner Saunders' case. Uh, this journal especially came out in 2020, uh, 2021. Uh, you can check out this issue if you're interested. A closely related body of work ha uh, has since then documented the cultural conflict between the Soviet Union and the Western democracies. Interestingly, one of the key weapons of the cultural Cold War was cinema. The US has long history of collaboration between the government and Hollywood in producing films for, for uh, foreign policy purposes. Tony Shaw, one of the most active scholars in this regard, investigate the complex relationship among filmmakers, censors, politicians, and government, uh, pro, uh, government propagandists in Hollywood Cold War, uh, which was came, into, came out in 2007, and discuss um, British cinema's contribution to Cold War propaganda in British cinema and the Cold War uh, in 2006. Along this way, for their part, Film historians have recently revealed how the CIA worked secretly with Hollywood during the Cold War in highlighting how the US film industry functioned as one of the cultural sectors of the state corporate network during the Cold War. A significant number of studies have scrutinized the Motion Picture Export uh, Association of America, MPEAA, and its global businesses in the Soviet Union, Eastern Europe, Turkey, Germany, and Spain, along with the Soviet films distribution in the US during this period. However, historians of Hollywood and European cinema might be surprised to discover how little has been written about the American involvement in Asian cinema during the cultural Cold War. Although um, the, the Cold War was by definition a global conflict, and the US confronted both the Soviet Union and China on the Asian periphery. Asia has often been glossed over in the cultural Cold War literature, most of which focuses on US cultural policy and is concerned with the European theater. Scholarship on the Cold War in Asia has certainly been growing for sure. However, very little of this scholarship deals with cultural matters and film cultures and industries in Asia during the Cold War have largely been overlooked. Moreover, little attention has been paid to the significances of US agencies clandestine activities in the cultural field. But thankfully, a number of important works on the subject have been published for the past several years, including um, a new edited book 
the Cold War and Asian cinemas by Po Shek Pu and Man Pong Ip. Um, and my uh, NTU colleague, Hi Wai Shem's recent book, The Mapping the Sinophone, the cultural production of Chinese language cinema in Singapore and Malaya before and during the Cold War. And Christina Klein's Cold War Cosmopolitanism period style in 1950s Korean cinema. And I am uh, co-editing a book uh, tentatively titled um, Asian Cinema and the Culture of Cold War with Darlene Espena, who is an assistant professor at, uh, at Singapore Management University. It will be published uh, from Amsterdam University Press Critical Asian uh, Cinema Studies and uh, series. This book is based on the papers presented at the same title academic conference held virtually in April 2021. The tentative title is too similar to Poshak Fu and Man Pong's anthology, The Cold War and Asian Cinemas. So if you have any uh, title suggestions, please feel free to let me know. Um, I'm really um, bad at naming um, such things. Okay, so uh, in this lecture today, my aim is to trace the CIA's involvement in the Asian film industries during the 1950s and its lasting effect in Asian cinema. My primary concern today is the Asia Foundation, which was established by San Francisco businessmen in 1951. Um, this philanthropic organization was clandestinely backed by the CIA to, ad uh, to advance American interest in Asia through supporting native intellectuals and cultural producers. Cinema was the Asia Foundation's one of the most heavily invested projects during the 1950s at least. And I will tell you uh, this story today. And now I will bring all of you to Los Angeles and I'm turning the clock back to 1953. Let's go back to Hollywood 1953. On December 17, 1953, Charles Tanner, the Hollywood liaison of a San Francisco based philanthropic organization, the Asia Foundation, was having lunch with two Hollywood big names. Frank Kefra, a big name Hollywood director, and Luigi Rurash, the head of foreign and domestic censorship at Paramount Studio. Before this meeting, Tanner had convened with Hollywood heavyweights such as Cecil B. DeMille, Walter Wenger, Herbert Yates, Alan Parr, and a group of first tier Hollywood script writers, including Winston Miller, who later uh, spent one month at Dai studio in Japan for supervising Dai A's film script. Carlton also, a former CIA agent, acted as mediator. The meeting had been arranged by Rurashi's office at Paramount Studio. So who was Charles Tanner? Charles Tanner was a former United States Information Service, USIS motion picture officer who had stationed in Korea and the Philippines during the Pacific War and after. He was working at the Asia Foundation's headquarters in San Francisco. This was his second mission to Hollywood since he had been hired in May, 1953. This time, the Asia Foundation head office had given him the task of consulting with some of Hollywood's most powerful, gifted, and ideologically appropriate personnel to discover whether Hollywood was willing to support the Asia Foundation's newly launched project in the Asian motion picture industry. Tanner had a particular subject in mind. The Southeast Asian Film Festival, scheduled to be held in Tokyo six months later. The Southeast Asian Film Festival was an annual event of the Federation of Motion Picture Producers in Southeast Asia, uh, called FPA, which was established in May 1953. It was the second international film organization in Asia after the International Film Festival of, I of India, IFFI, in Delhi in 1952. IFFI is known as the, um, the first international film festival ever held in Asia. Interestingly enough, the FPA's objective was, quote unquote, to promote the motion picture industry in the countries of Southeast Asia and to raise the artistic and technical standard of motion pictures and ensure cultural dissemination and interchange of motion pictures in the Far East. Given this objective, 
What was the logic behind Kenner's meetings with Hollywood producers, directors, writers, and executives in support of the FPA? Likewise, for what purpose did the Asia Foundation become involved in the, in the formation of the FPA and its annual film festival? Who was Tanner? And why were Paramount executive Rush and prominent Hollywood directors like Pram Capra and Cecil B. DeMille attached to the Asia Foundation's activities? What were the consequences of the Asia Foundation's motion picture project? And how did the film industry in Asia respond? To answer all the questions I raised, I will begin with the Asia Foundation. The Asia Foundation, formerly known as the Committee for A Free Asia, was originally a creation of the executive branch intended to propagate the US foreign policy interest in Asia. It was established in 1951. Alan Valentine, a former Olympic gold medal winning rugby player and a former president of the University of Rochester, became the first president of the committee. Besides its headquarters in San Francisco and two external offices in Washington DC and New York City, the Asia Foundation, as of 1954, had operated 14 field offices in major cities from Tokyo and Manila to Karachi, Seoul, and Taipei. Although the ostensible identity of the Asia Foundation was a private, non-governmental fund foundation, it secretly received considerable financial subsidy from the CIA, and it should rather be called a quasi-non-governmental organization. The Asia Foundation's primary activities were supporting journalists, writers, and opinion leaders, and encouraging them to fight against the communist forces. In this regard, the Asia Foundation was a twin brother of the National Committee for A Free Europe, which was founded on June 2nd, 1949, in the beginning of the second Truman administration. As a brainchild of CIA's Deputy Director Alan Dulles and Director of Plan Frank Wiesner, Committee for A Free Europe worked for the, uh, for the spreading of American influence in Europe and to oppose the Soviet one. The Committee's International Association of Elite American and European Political and Cultural Intellectuals, the Congress for Cultural Freedom, CCF, was established in June 1950 with the inaugural conference held in West Berlin. Using massive CIA subsidies, the Congress for Cultural Freedom has rapidly evolved into the US main weapon in the cultural Cold War. The Asia Foundation, received significant financial support from the Committee for a Free Europe and the Crusade for Freedom. Dwight Eisenhower, who became the 34th president of the United States in 1953, was one of the founding members of the Committee for a Free Europe. And the Hollywood producer, Walter Wonger, was a Hollywood chairman of the Crusade for Freedom. The Asia Foundation's CIA connection was not publicly acknowledged until it was eventually unveiled in 1967 when uh, a, ref, uh, a left, leftist inclined magazine, Rampart, published a special report on CIA funding for various cultural and educational organizations. The New York Times simultaneously published a series of reports revealing secret CIA sponsorship of the Congress for Cultural Freedom. Obviously, the Congress for Cultural Freedom was the primary target for the New York Times article, but the Asia Foundation, although less controversy than the Congress for Cultural Freedom, was otherwise included in the article. So after the 1967 New York Times expose, the Asia Foundation promised to cut its ties with CIA. With or without CIA funding, the Asia Foundation continued to thrive for the remainder of the 1960s and beyond, and it still exists. So um, let's see the most recent promotional video of the Asia Foundation. Uh, it's, uh, it's about five minute video and to see what they are doing these days. Thank you. 
The general impression that people have of Asia is this image of the Asian miracle. While the macro level looks like it's on a very, very positive trajectory, there is a cost. And that, that cost comes in social and human terms. There still remains poverty, problems with governance, access to justice and respect for human rights. The woman's economic participation, political participation, really is crucial to the development of Asia. Subnational conflicts that are large based on ethnic or religious minority issues. Climate change, global warming, however you want to describe it. They will not long remain challenges and problems for Asia. They will be challenges and problems for all of us. So I think it behooves us to make sure that Asia is on a proper developing path. And that's what the work of the Asia Foundation is about. The Asia Foundation looks for creative solutions to Asia's most thorny development challenges. And I think that's the reason why the foundation is regarded by many as the premier non-profit, non-government organization working on development in Asia. How you adapt your institutions to deal with a growing middle class with rising expectations is the name of the game. How do you ensure that certain segments of society, whether it's organized along religious lines or caste lines or class lines or gender lines, everyone has a fair share in the development process. What the Asia Foundation does that to me is the the better way to think about this is that economics and governance are really intertwined. Take women's economic participation, for example. We know that the way women invest their income is plowed back into their families, into their communities. This raises the standard of living for everybody. And that's the basis of the multiplier effect that we will have in improvement of lives of people in Asia. In many instances, the formal justice system is overloaded with disputes, cases drag on for years. If a government, if a state cannot provide justice, then you'll have extremists that develop and they'll provide an alternative, and it's not a good alternative. Being able to work with, with Asian governments, with Asian NGOs, with citizens groups to mitigate disasters, for example, is not just about saving lives and preventing great destruction in a particular place, but it's also about preventing economic collapse, which in one country could have ramifications for a much broader region. Asia is the home for some of the most long-standing subnational ethnic and religious conflicts of any region in the world. The Asia Foundation has an outstanding record of being a quiet facilitator of negotiations and reconciliation processes to overcome some of these disputes. The Foundation's role is really one of playing a supportive and catalytic role in bringing the essential actors together to try and forge a common understanding of problems and to find creative solutions. Asia would not be where it is today were it not for all the good work and its various forms, which the Asia Foundation has done over the last 60 years. The Foundation's mission has been to remain in Asia for Asia. Rather than seeing the local society as the problem, we see it as the solution. Its involvement, its participation in conversations within Asian societies is really quite unique. They know the politics. They know the economic issues. They know the social issues. They know the culture. It's our partners and the Asia Foundation putting our different perspectives and our heads together to solve a common problem. Whether it be in terms of governance and transparency or rule of law or economic development or women's participation or environmental issues, we're making a contribution. The Asia Foundation's built around an idea of better, fairer, more just governance.
No other organization operates with a range of countries in an area so central to our future. Yeah, um, so it's a five minute video. Um, Asia Foundation's main uh, focus has not been changed much, um, you know, from the, the one you just saw, um, what they are doing right now. And then if you see the 1950s and 60s, Asia Foundation works, as main focus has not been changed much, but their regional focus has moved significantly from um, East Asia to uh, Central Asia and South Asia. Um, and also at the same time, if you visit their website, uh, the website um, shows the official history of the Asia Foundation. Uh, from that website, um, from the official history, the history of the institution begins in 1954, not 1951. It seems like they wanted to, to cut down, cut the, the tie uh, with the, the its, its um, initial name, Committee for A Free Asia. There's not a single um, evidence uh, about the history, the early history of Asia Foundation, the official version of the history. And also, Alan Valentine, the first president of uh, Asia Foundation, is not exist, does not exist in the official history of Asia Foundation, which is quite interesting to see. Anyway, um, uh, much of the Asia Foundation's early work uh, was in the educational field, improving school and library facilities, assisting in literary campaigns, supporting research centers and helping to develop national history textbooks. The Asia Foundation donated books to the universities and provide a grant to anti-communist professors who work there. For example, my university, uh, formerly known as Nanyang University, as well as a new Asia college, now part of Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, they were two of the recipients of the Asia Foundation during the 1950s. Um, I am working on um, the history of 1950s Asia Foundation's involvement at Nanyang Technological University. Uh, back then it was known as Nanyang University. Uh, quite a fascinating history back then in 1950s. So I hope I can complete it um, in, uh, in three or four years. The, the table, the foundation supported projects within individual Asian countries as well as cooperation among Asian countries. At the height of the Cold War in the 1950s and 60s, the Asia Foundation was the American organization that perhaps best embodied the cultural Cold War in Asia. And the Asia Foundation recognized the power of cinema early on. Indeed, cinema was the Asia Foundation's most heavily invested project, at least it's all the days. Under the leadership of Robert Bloom, this guy, who became the second president of the Asia Foundation in 1954, this organization had clandestinely advocated anti-communist motion picture industry personnel, ranging from producers, directors, and technicians to critics and writers in Japan Hong Kong, South Korea, as well as American and British motion picture producers in Malaya, Burma, Singapore, and Thailand through largely covert activities between 1953 and 1962. The Asia Foundation's first feature film project was The People Went Through, uh, Ludu Aung Tan, based on a play written by a Burmese prime minister, Unu. It was produced in 1953. The film's message is the, uh, the good democratic method are superior to the evil totalitarian ways of the communists. The Asia Foundation's aim was to distribute the film in Burma, Thailand, India, Hong Kong, Japan, and Taiwan, where the Buddhist occupied the majority of the population. The film, however, despite the foundation's um, uh, you know, uh, support, failed to receive favorable reviews from both continents and performed poorly in Asia. But they, the people went through is now, regard, uh, now regarded as one of the important post-war classics in the 1950s Burmese cinema. Um, you can watch the film with Burmese language, no English subtitles um, is given on YouTube. So if you are curious about this film, you can go and watch the film on YouTube. But as I told you, um, there's no English subtitles. 
So accordingly, um, after, the, after the failure of the, Asia, uh, the people withdrew, the Asia Foundation shifted instead to the promotion of films by Asian filmmakers in Asia and helped to build film studios in South Korea, Hong Kong, Southeast Asia, and elsewhere in the region. They also followed the CIA's usual tactics, a tactic and focused on supporting pro-US and anti-communist leaders in the region. The Asia Foundation supported Japan's Nagata Masaichi in his bid to become a leader of the free Asia film industries. In addition, uh, the experienced technicians of Daiei Studio received guidance from a Hollywood screenwriter, Winston Miller, chosen by the Foundation's motion picture team. And indirectly financed nine feature films in Hong Kong by powering US dollars uh, throughout the 1950s into Asia pictures. The project of a local journalist, Chang Kuo Shen, who later found uh, Hong Kong Baptist University's prestigious School of Journalism. Um, to see um, his legacy at Hong Kong Baptist University is still powerful. South Korea was another beneficiary. South Korea's Korean Motion Picture Cultural Association, KMPCA, in fact, received the entire budget of the association's early operations. With core motion picture projects in Japan, Hong Kong, and South Korea, as well as small and ad hoc projects in Burma, Ceylon, and, um, uh, in, in the Philippines, the Asia Foundation invested enormous energy in Asia's film industries. On occasion, the Asia Foundation's motion picture team even brought in Hollywood Cold War warriors such as Cecil B. DeMille, Frank Capra, Walter Wenger, Frank Borjage, Louis Rush, Winston Miller, and Y. Frank Freeman as project advisors and mentors. With a clear and consistent vision of free Asia, the field agent of this philanthropic organization encouraged, encouraged native film producers and directors to fight against the communist forces with proper guidance from the foundation's motion picture officers and Hollywood's anti-communist creative personnel. The culmination of their effort was the inauguration of the FPA, Federation of Motion Picture Producers in Southeast Asia. It had chiefly functioned as a base camp for the, uh, for the Asia Foundation's motion picture project in Asia, particularly in Japan, Hong Kong, and South Korea. What the Asia Foundation motion picture project team had hoped for was to minimize or eliminate the effectiveness of leftist anti-free world influence in the region cinema and win the psychological war against ever-thriving communist forces from their perspective. In the early 1950s, threatened by the ever-expanding communism throughout the region, particularly uh, the establishment of the PLC, ascending popularities of communism in Indonesia and the Philippines, and the outbreak of the Korean War, the U.S. government believed it necessary to construct a free Asia bloc in the region. By supporting Japan's role in, in Southeast Asia, therefore, the Eisenhower administration finally began to apply its new national security policy that became known as New Look, uh, whose primary object in Asia and the Middle East in the period of 1953 to 56 was, quote unquote, to reduce the American burden in coast and manpower of holding the line around the periphery of the communist bloc. Therefore, Japan needed to recuperate its economic alliances with Southeast Asia. And the Asia Foundation and its president, Robert Bloom, understood it very well. To achieve this mission, the Asia Foundation supported the FPA and its mastermind, Nagata Masaichi. At the first FPA meeting in Manila in 1953, Nagata Masaichi was nominated as the sole candidate for the position of president and elected without any objection. Ron Ron Shou, president of Shaw Brothers in Hong Kong, became the vice president. The headquarters would be located in Tokyo. Six months later, the first film festival began. Six member countries, Japan, Hong Kong, Malaya, the Philippines, Thailand, and Taiwan sent 15 feature films. Each of Japan's big five studios submitted its latest films. In addition to the Japanese films, the Philippines' three major studios introduced five films. 
Nagata Masaichi, president of Daiei Pictures and president of the FPA, delivered his welcome speech at the first festival. Quote unquote. Being president of the FPA, I am happy to note that the festival at which best pictures produced by Southeast Asian countries contest for the highest honors that are deserved for the most beautiful, harmonious, and elegant will mark an epoch in the cultural history of Asia. The event is designed to better the quality of motion pictures, promote exchange of cultural achievement of each country in Southeast Asia, and enhance friendly relations among the participating nations through the screening of choice product and free exchange of opinions on the entries. In 1951, Rashomon, which was produced by Nagata Masaichi himself, was submitted to the Venice International Film Festival and unexpectedly won the Grand Prix. A year later, Rashomon won the award for best picture, uh, best foreign um, language films at the, at the year's Oscars. Back then, they, they called it an honorary award. It brought simultaneous respect and jealousy from other nations in the region. This was certainly the peak of Nata Masaichi's career. Uh, we see the, um, the, uh, the ceremony video at the 1952 um, Oscar Award. Hmm. The honorary award section of the program, President of the Academy, Mr. Charles Brackett. <laughs> At 10 o'clock last night, as our bylaws specify, the Board of Governors met to decide upon the honorary awards. These single out achievements which do not fall in the categories voted by our general membership, but which seem to the Board to demand Academy recognition. To present the first of these, that for the best foreign language film of the year, a Parisian in America, and a very welcome one, Mademoiselle Leslie Carroll. <laughs> Language Film Award goes to a remarkable Japanese film, Rashomon. Japanese government's overseas office will accept the award. Mr. Yoshida is coming on stage now to accept this award for this most unusual film of the Japanese legend, which relates five different interpretations of a single story. I just wish to say thank you. And um, I feel particularly privileged and honored and quite excited tonight. Thank you. It's an unusual and brief speech for an official of any government, I would say. And about the picture, well, close to Yeah, um, Nagata Masaich didn't know much about this event, and then so he couldn't attend the, the, the ceremony. Instead, um, he he attended the, the a year after 1953 Academy Award and, and grabbed the trophy and took a picture of it. Um, so not surprisingly, um, at the event. At the, at the Southeast Asian Film Festival in 1954, um, Daiei film, The Golden Demon, worked away with the, with the award for the best motion picture and its producer, Nagata Masaichi, took the trophy. So Nagata Masaichi was the most powerful uh, motion picture executives in Asia um, around that time. The special uh, MPAA, Motion Picture Association for America's Mitchell Camera Prize, was awarded to a Thai film, Santibina, which was produced by the Far East Film Company in Bangkok, co-founded by a Thai producer and cinematographer, Aldi Pastonji, and an American screenwriter and producer, Robert Norris. Uh, Mitchell Camera was a dream for most Asian producers and directors around that time. It was the most expensive and most advanced motion picture cameras. So Mitchell Camera um, you know, uh, symbolized the, the, uh, the advancement of the Hollywood filmmaking. So um, uh, 
to my knowledge, in back in South Korea in 1953, 1954, there was only one Beecher camera in the entire South Korea. So same goes to other countries as well. So getting a Beecher camera was a big award for many uh, film producers around that time. This beautiful um, Thai classic has now been fully restored um, by the Thai, by wonderful Thai film archive. And you can watch this film with English subtitles on YouTube. Luckily, uh, Thai Film Archive made an important effort to make it free, of freely available on YouTube for free and with, with uh, English subtitles. So I strongly recommend to, to, to watch this film. Um, I'm, not gonna, uh, I'm, I'm not gonna play th this film right now, but, but I strongly recommend it. It's a beautiful film. It's, a, it's, a, it's an absolute classic of uh, Asian cinema in the 1950s. Um, a two-time um, Academy Award-winning Hollywood director, Frank Borujake, was the chair of the award committee. He attended the festival as a U.S. movie industry, uh, industry representative on behalf of MPAA. So with the exception of Santibina, however, the Japanese film industry dominated the festival, grabbing five major awards. An editorial in Kinema Junpo, a Japanese film magazine, wrote somewhat pretentiously. Quote unquote. The quality of Japanese cinema justifies the Japanese film industry's dominion in the festival. To put it bluntly, we are questioning whether the festival still needs any competition categories. Well, after the first event, the second edition was held in, in Singapore in 1955 and the third in Hong Kong in 1960, 1956. South Korea became a new member country at the Hong Kong event. At the Hong Kong festival in 1956, Alexander Brenton, the governor of Hong Kong, gave a welcome speech at the opening reception in which he remarked, quote unquote, it gives me great pleasure to open the 1956 Southeast Asian Film Festival, if, not, if for not, no other reason than that it teaches me some geography, for I had never realized before that Japan was part of Southeast Asia. But whether that is uh, so or not, I am quite sure that the inclusion of Japan, which has produced so many outstanding pictures, is much to be welcomed in a festival of this kind. And the Federation was wise to include her. Whether or not his speech influenced the decision, the FPA's name was changed from the Federation of Motion Picture Producers in Southeast Asia to the Federation of Motion Picture Producers in Asia after the Hong Kong gathering. It had been renamed its name until 1980. Uh, it had been um, remained its name until 1983 when the FPA decided to change its name to Asia Pacific Film Festival due to the presence of Australia and New Zealand as, member, as new member countries. As such, this festival has a long and complicated history. The festival was for at least first decade the single most important annual event, uh, annual cinema event in Asia. But surprisingly, this important festival has long been overlooked or simply forgotten in the chronicle of Asian cinema. Likewise, in the field of film festival studies in Asia, Asian film festival has not been received as the appropriate scrutiny. It is because I think the festival does not comfortably fit within the rigid borders of national cinema studies. Furthermore, film festivals are relatively a new field of inquiry in Asian context when it comes to the history of film festivals in Asia. Unlike other nation-bound film festivals, uh, what we say in you know, Busan, Shanghai, um, um, and in Hong Kong, and so on, the Asia Film Festival was to be hosted neither in a single city nor a country. Instead, this film festival adopted a peripatetic system that moved from country to country each year, and no member country was allowed to accommodate the festival two consecutive years. From the beginning, therefore, Asian Film Festival was not a conventional film festival per se, but a regional alliance summit among the region's film executives, which accompanied the screenings of each participant annual output a series of forums and film equipment fairs and exhibitions, while public screening was not considered. Indeed, Asia Film Festival, the FPA, and other equally important festivals and regional organizations in the period were seldom bound to a single nation. They were mostly 
regionally constructed entities closely tied to non-governmental organizations and or cultural policies of post-war U.S. hegemony. The true aim of the FPA was therefore, in the words of Kim gwan Su, president of the Korean Motion Picture Cultural Association, um, to protect free Asia from the invasion of the communist force throughout the cinema. However, at the end of the 1950s, the San Francisco Office of Asia Foundation decided to decrease its involvement with the FPA and significantly cut the budget for most of its motion picture project in Asia. The Asia Foundation could not fully achieve its initial goals. Many factors contributed to the disappointment of its motion picture operations. But most importantly, the foundation's core collaborators in Asia were not capable of leading the regional organizations. Many of them had insufficient experience in filmmaking. Their films attracted neither local audiences nor Hollywood sophisticated foreign film distributors. Furthermore, the film industries in Asia had been growing rapidly without the US direct help during the latter half of the 1950s. South Korea, Taiwan, and Hong Kong experienced sort of golden age of cinema in the 1960s, when each country churned out over 200 films per year. The Asia Foundation gradually reduced the scope of its motion picture project and terminated the operation full entirely in the early 1960s. So the foundation's motion picture professionals all left the foundation one by one, and none of them was working for the foundation by the early 1960s. Charles Tanner, I began this lecture with, with Charles Tanner, the most aggressive anti-communist um, Tanner left the foundation in 1956 as a dedicated Christian. Tanner established the Covenant players in his hometown in Oxnard, Oxnard California. He wrote over 3,000 Christian-themed plays before his death in 2006, and the Covenant players became one of the largest professional theater companies dedicated to Christian plays. Lloyd Bloom, the second president of the Asia Foundation, left the foundation to direct a three-year project for the Council on Foreign Relations financed by the Ford Foundation titled The United States and China in World Affairs. In 1965, just, uh, just three years, just two years later, Bloom died suddenly. He was only 54 years old. His book at the United States and China in World Affairs was published uh, posthumously in 1966. The Asia Foundation's last significant motion picture activity was to introduce selected Asian films, particularly non-communist ones, to the newly launched International Film Festival in the US, the San Francisco International Film Festival. I've written a chapter about the San Francisco Festival in my book, uh, which is chapter five uh, in, in, in Cinema and the Culture Cold War. Mm -hmm. The screening of South Korea's Aimless Bullet was part of the Asia Foundation's effort, according to uh, Charles Tanner, to create opportunities for Asian film producers, other than those from Japan and India, to better compete on the international market. So Asia Foundation really helped uh, to introduce films made out, Asian films made outside India and Japan. So films were uh, films from South Korea and Hong Kong uh, and the Philippines were included uh, in the all year uh, years of San Francisco Film Festival history. Surprisingly the FPA network did not disappear. When the Asia Foundation's Cold War mission ended, a new network emerged. Ironically, the new network, which I call the Asian Studio Network, used the existing regional and interregional network that, that the Asia Foundation and a group of anti-communist motion picture producers had struggled to create and maintain throughout the preceding decade. The second network that included the last two chapters of my book begins um, at this critical juncture. This part argues that the unprecedented new, uh, new motion picture studio network in East Asia, Hong Kong, South Korea, Taiwan, and Japan did not emerge out of the blue. A Chinese filmmaker, Li Hanshang, um, who started his career in Hong Kong and then moved to Taiwan and then went back to, to uh, Hong Kong in the early, in the early 1970s. Um, he recalled um, of the 1960s Asian Film Festival, quote unquote. To be perfectly honest, 
The underlying motive for organizing a festival was to cement connections and help each other to each other sell films. That was exactly how the particular festival was formed under the arrangement of Daiei's Nagata Masai's Run Run Show, Korean director Shin sang -ok, and several prominent producer of producers of the Philippines. I have a video. So let's look at the 1966 festival in Seoul. It was the second hosting of South Korea after 1962. I think the video um, lasts about uh, three or four minutes. Um, unfortunately, there is no English subtitles. So I'll lower the volume and then try to explain what is happening in this video. Let's have a look at it. <laughs> Delegates from seven Southeast Asian countries are arriving in Seoul in May to attend the Asia Film Festival. It is the second time Seoul hosts the festival. President Park Jong hee invited 197 participants from seven different countries. You can see a South Korean filmmaker, Shin sang -ok, is is standing right next to uh, President Park Jong hee All the delegates and participants were required to visit uh, Panmunjom, the 38th parallel between North and, between North and South. Yeah, on May 9th, the festival ends with a closing ceremony. Um, Taiwan, Japan, Hong Kong, Vietnam, Philippines, um, uh, uh, Singapore, and Malaya. The Best Picture Award went to the Blue and Black uh, uh, Hong Kong film with Lin Dai. Who, um, who killed herself in two years. Best Actress and Actress, uh, Best Actor and Actresses Award went to uh, the Korean actors, Bang no and Choi Eun-hee. Special award for freedom uh, went to a uh, Filipino films. This is uh, the famous uh, gala show, uh, what they call Galaxy of Stars, with Southeast Asian and East Asia's top actresses. It uh, um, at, at least in the early um, uh, years of festival, I think about two two decades um, up until early 1970s. Um, every each year, um, the host country, host country and city um, arranged this uh, galaxy of stars. Yes. Right. Um, so if you are, uh, if you uh, if you know further about this, uh, there's also a YouTube video um, of 1962's 
um, Asia Film Festival, which was also hosted in South Korea, in Seoul. Um, you also can watch that, that 1962 video as well, so 1960. Um, so, Naoto Masaich, by the late 1960s, lost his influence over the festival. Taiye declared bankruptcy in 1971. Nagata Masaich left the studio the following year. In the same year, Asian Film Festival was held in, in Seoul as a non-competition event. Japan sent only a film print and no industry personnel attended. During the festival, Hong Kong, Taiwanese, and even some South Korean producers and executives seriously considered canceling the festival as no regional industry moguls were left except online show. Once opulent and influential, the FPA network like largely disappeared in the mid 1970s. But by the mid 70s, Asian cinema uh, was entering to a new era. Mao died on September 9, 1976. With Mao's death, the 10 year history of the Cultural Revolution in China came to a close. Deng Xiaoping became China's supreme leader, and his policy was characterized by economic reform, modernization, and liberalization. With the nation's political changes, Chinese cinema developed rapidly in the new era. In 1978, 153 students, including Zhang Yimou, uh, Tin Zhuang Zhang, and Chen Kaiga, attended the, 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 um, the reopened Beijing Film Academy. This reopening marked the beginning of the Chinese uh, fifth generation. The first post-war film movement in China to place Chinese cinema on the map of world cinema in Hong Kong. The Hong Kong International Film Festival opened in 1976 and became Asia's first film festival devoted not to the commercial interest of the industry, but to cinema as film, culture, and art. A year later, Australia hosted its first Asian film festival. Sydney was the festival city. By the time the FPA underwent its major identity transformation from Asia to Asia Pacific, a US initiated film festival that aimed at bringing films from Asia and the Pacific had been launched in Hawaii. The Hawaii International Film Festival was established in 1981. The festival became the first venue that introduced the Chinese fifth generation cinema to the US audience and critics when the festival invited Zhang Yimou and Chen Kaiga in 1985, as you can see in this picture, in the red circle. You can see the Zhang Yimou and Chen Kaiga. And uh, right uh, on, the, on the left side of uh, Zhang Yimou, you see Paul Clark, um, one, of those, one of the pioneers of Chinese cinema studies in the US, um, was born in New Zealand. Um, now he teaches in New Zealand. He was teaching uh, at the University of Hawaii in the 1980s. And he was the one who invited those two uh, Chinese, young Chinese filmmakers to Hawaii. That was the beginning of um, their Chinese fifth generation's presence in the US academia. So after the Hong Kong and Hawaii's notable success as a showcase of Asian cinema, the first Manila International Film Festival was held in 1982. Um, there's lots of stories to tell about Manila Film uh, International Film Festival. So, you know, there's a big tragedies there. Um, so, if you're curious, uh, just Google um, about the first Manila International Film Festival. So, you will see uh, lots of surprising stories behind the festival. On the other hand, Japan again initiated its own prestigious international film festival. The Tokyo International Film Festival had its first event in 1985. Interestingly enough, in June 1985, the same year as Tokyo, um, Tokyo International Film Festival was inaugurated, Tokyo hosted the 30th Asia Pacific Film Festival. The FPA handed out honors to four men for their roles in establishing the Federation 30 years ago. Nagata Masaich, Ron Ron Shaw, Manuel de Leon, and Prince Yugala, nearly a decade after leaving the, the FPA, the now retired Nagata Masaich received a trophy on behalf of the other recipient. Three months later, Nagata died at his home in Tokyo. So a year later, Ron Ron Shou closed his film production unit in Hong Kong completely uh, and began focusing on TV. The era, the end of the era, indeed. In post-Cold War Asia, the FPA's presence in the region has been diminishing since the 1980s. The FPA was de facto the Cold War film network in Asia. What the Asia Foundation's motion picture project aimed at was 
to construct an alliance of anti-communist motion picture producers in Asia and to use the network as an anti-communist force to win the psychological war against the Soviet Union and China. This initial aim was lost. In the new millennium, the FPA and its annual film festival, now known as Asia Pacific Film Festival, carried little crowd in Asia's thriving film cultures and industries. Asia Pacific Film Festival is still going on. The most recent event was uh, being held in, 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 in Macau in 2019. Um, it's very hard to find information about Asia Pacific Film Festival because um, I don't know, I don't know why, but, um, but in the, um, after 2010, I think Taiwan hosted uh, three times of Asia Pacific Film Festival. I think Taiwan has some, some sort of interest in leading um, Asia Pacific Film Festival and, 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 and FPA. Uh, maybe um, the FPA was a failed project for the Asia Foundation. However, it should be noted here that the Asia Foundation had played a significant role in the formation of the early inter-Asian motion picture industry network in Cold War Asia, which in the end had ultimately redrawn the imaginary, map, imaginary and geopolitical map of Asia in ways they never anticipated. Uh, actually, okay, that this end of my lecture today. Um, I think I have to stop here. Um, I, Lawrence, um, actually, um, you know, um, uh, I prepared about 10 minutes to tell the story of my book, how it started and developed and eventually got published. Um, do you want to hear it? Yes, yes, please. I, I, would, I was about to say that. Yes, please. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. So, um, from dissertation to book, uh, I, I prepared this part because I thought um, there are, there will be some um, uh, graduate student and PhD student who are working on dissertations or um, the postdoc scholars um, who are trying to turn their books into uh, dissertation to book and so on. Um, so probably it will only take 10 minutes to tell the story of my book. Uh, it's a long journey. Um, I, had my, I had my dissertation defense in March uh, 2011 and Cinema and the Culture of Cold War came out in December, 2020. Uh, so what has happened during the 10 years? So uh, why it took so long, why it took 10 years? So I'll tell you the story. Cinema and the Culture of Cold War is, is not entirely based on my doctoral dissertation, which is titled as the Transnational Asian Studio System, Cinema, Nation State, and Globalization in Cold War Asia, which is quite different title than my actual book, right? I was overly too ambitious back then, and the title has all, uh, all the hot keyword, transnational, nation, globalization, Cold War, and Asia. Um, I think I was a bit too ambitious back then. This dissertation um, explores uh, the, uh, the unprecedented network of 1960s motion picture studios in Asia, and my particular focus was South Korea's in films, Hong Kong Show Brothers, and Taiwan's old, uh, grand motion pictures of Lian Shang. Among all the chapters, I have, um, I have seven, um, seven chapters in my dissertation. I've only used three chapters, chapter three, four, and six uh, for my first book. So what happened? Uh, when I commenced a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Michigan in 2011, uh, my plan was to turn uh, my dissertation into a book. Everything changed, however, when after a short research trip to Palo Alto in January 2012. It was a two-day visit to, um, to the Hoover Institution Archives at Stanford University. And I just wanted to check the details uh, about the Asia Foundation that I briefly mentioned in my chapter on the Asia Film Festival. Back then, I didn't know much about the Asia Foundation and I just mentioned about it. But at the Hoover, uh, I found a massive trove of the Asia Foundation's record. In particular, I discovered two big boxes of information on their motion picture project in Asia. And most of those folders were never been opened. So this was my Eureka moment. I, uh, I felt that I was the first one to open all those precious files and documents and memorandums and all those you know, letters and so on. Uh, but I had to, had to decide, decide um, should I postpone my initial publication plans and change my research direction completely or just ignore these findings uh, and complete the book first? Um, it, was a hard, it was a tough decision and I had to, I chose to change my research direction. 
And um, uh, it took me another eight years because of that. <laughs> Between 1912 and 19, uh, 2012 and 2016, I conducted uh, extensive archive research at the Hoover Institution Archives, um, Yale University's manuscript and archives. That, are, that uh, Yale University has a collection of uh, Robert de Bloom, uh, because Robert de Bloom is, uh, is alma mater of Yale. Um, the CV Star East Asian Library at Columbia University, um, the Margaret Herrick Library of Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences in Los Angeles. I found uh, information about, uh, uh, about Frank, uh, uh, Frank Brujage and his visiting to uh, uh, Southeast Asian Film Festival. Um, and the, the Hong Kong Film Archive, of course, yes, Hong Kong Film Archive back then helped me greatly uh, to find materials. Um, and the Hong Kong University Special Collections. Hong Kong University Special Collections had, um, had a, Hong Kong University had a very a unique collection of Asian pictorial, uh, the monthly magazine published by Asia uh, Asia Press um, of, of Chang uh, The Korean Film Archive, yes, Korean Film Archive helped me to find um, you know films and um, and the script of the 1950s, 50s and 60s South Korean films um, that had. Network uh, that was uh, financed and invested by uh, by Asia Found, uh, Asia Foundation, um, and then uh, is, uh, the the Korean uh, International Library of Korea, the Asian Film Archive uh, helped me to find information about 1955 uh, Asia Film Festival in Singapore. The National Archives of Singapore has also has uh, has extensive research materials, and the National Film and Sound Archive of Australia in Canberra. Uh, had uh, has um, has information about 1978 um, uh, Asia Pacific Film Festival, which was held in uh, in in Sydney. The uh, the first five chapters in the book are the outcomes of this extensive archive research and were written mostly between 19, uh, 2015 and 2017 after I moved to Singapore's Nanyang Technological University. Uh, in 2018, I was fortunate enough to spend six months at the Australian National University ANU in Canberra under the, um, the, the Nanyang Technological University and ANU Exchange Professor Program for junior faculty. Um, I don't know if anyone has been to Canberra, but Canberra is a very quiet and peaceful city and nothing else to do other than studying your own stuff. Um, so uh, the first full draft of Cinema and the Culture Code was completed during my stay in Canberra. So if anyone wants to spend six uh, peaceful months uh, to complete your draft, I strongly recommend you to, um, to check out ANU and Canberra. Uh, it's not like Sydney and, 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 and Melbourne. Um, and uh, and the two years later in, in December 2020, the book had been, um, uh, has been published uh, from the Cornell University Press. Um, so, I, and I'm working on my second book project based on the unused portion of my dissertation because I have uh, three unused chapters from my dissertation. So that is, uh, that are the base of my second book project and I'm going to write um, a, a three or four more chapters uh, to, to make it as a book. It's tentatively titled uh, Border Crossings in Celebrity Asia, South Korea's Encounter with Sinopon Cinemas. This, um, uh, interestingly enough, this is exactly the same title as my dissertation proposal, which was submitted in May 2007. Um, I didn't actually realize when I, when I, uh, made, uh, when I, when I named the, uh, the title, uh, and then I, I realized that okay, uh, actually it's the same as the, uh, the, the 2007 dissertation proposal's uh, title. So any, anyway, so, so I don't need life. So um, I hope to see my second book's uh, publication in, in, in 2024 or 2025, depending on how, how much time I can secure for my book, because I cannot go to uh, ANU for my, for my book. But now I have, a, you know, my daughter goes to primary school and my wife works, so it's impossible to do that. So let's see how it goes. Uh, right. Okay. This is really um, the end. Um, I think I talked too much, and then hope it was helpful. So I'll stop talking. Lawrence. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Song Jun. Uh, before we uh, open the Q and A session, I would like to uh, add a few words. And first of all, let's all all thank Song Jun for this really invaluable and wonderful sharing from the stuff on the pages. On well on behind the screen, on the pages, to your behind the scene um, efforts, which, wow, well, it's just really, uh, I didn't know about all this like lo location, geopolitical and geographical locations that you have been 
personally traveling and and doing your archival search. Um, so thank you for again uh, for sharing these wonderful materials. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I, uh, I I have personally have some questions, but before I ask my own question, uh, I would love to exercise my privilege as a moderator to open up the Q and A session to see if there are questions, comments, and thoughts from our audiences, um, uh, especially for those of you um, who have questions but would not want to talk about it right now, like verbally, uh, you can type, please feel free to type in your question because we, we do this a lot during the pandemic uh, meetings, right? So please feel free to uh, type in your questions and thoughts in the chat box below uh, at the bottom of the screen. Uh, you can either uh, type in Chinese or English, or uh, as long uh, as as long as we have interpreter translator for you. Uh, it's so feel free to do that, and you are also welcome to raise your question directly uh, to us uh, if you want. Okay, so I'm opening up the floor for the audiences before I ask my own question, which I do have some <laughs> uh, questions from the our audiences. I've, I've seen uh, familiar friends and well, there are some our, our students at uh, National Yangmin Jiao Tong, but also there are other, uh, uh, I think, colleagues and friends uh, outside the community. Uh, so please feel free. Okay, here. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, I saw, uh, so on behalf, so before the question, I, I saw in the box, uh, the chair, of International Center for Culture Studies here. Uh, Professor Joyce Liu, uh, she had to leave earlier. Uh, so she sent re regards to you, uh, Sangjin. I uh, said, Sang dear Sangjin, thank you so much for your excellent and valuable work. Your book provided a broader picture of the cult uh, cultural co war through the film industry in Asia. It is a real success and a significant contribution to this feel. Uh, I'm sorry that I have to leave early. So send sending my regards. Yeah. So hopefully in the future you will have the chance. Uh, we would have the chance to exchange uh, in person. Yeah. So that's from the chair of the center. Uh, so we have another question. Another question from Ying uh, Fan Chen, uh, who is also a friend of mine. Uh, thanks. A uh, question from Ying Fan. Thanks for such a, a fascinating book talk and a brief review of your book composition process which is very helpful for everyone here, including me, myself, uh, just, who is just beginning my career. So my question is that I am wondering if you have any thoughts mm -hmm. about the influences that uh, inherited from the old Cold War structure to, to today's Asian film industries. So based on your research and uh, observation, what's the role of Singapore, for example, the place you are now staying uh, uh, may not your main research interest is this? Uh, is this an Asian industry? Uh, Singapore, take Singapore as a case. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. Yeah, that's that's a very interesting question. But um, I I don't know if I have a right answer where um you know can provide much thought. Uh, because to me, if to some extent, um, uh, anything after nineteen. 80s or 90s are too new, like too recent. Uh, but anyway, I'll try to give some answers or my, my thought about it. Um, so as I told you, um, um, as, as I write down, wrote down in my book, um, so mid-1970s was really the end of uh, the first um, uh, the, the scope of my book. So what I say, um, um, this Asian Cinema Network uh, began in 1950s and ended in 1970s at some point, uh, that's what I say, it's impossible to say exact the date or the time of the end of Asian Cinema Network, but I can see, I see it's sort of 19, uh, mid 1970s when South Korea, Shin Sang Wook, uh, the, the only major players in the 1960s stopped working and left um, the film industry for, for various reasons. That was the initial end of the time. Um, and then, but the, the, the network they, um, they constructed uh, during the first two decades, uh, six from 50, uh, 1950s and 60s, largely maintained until, um, until the late, until mid 1990s, when, when China actually opened its, uh, its uh, film market. 
So when China opened its film market, however, uh, not full ways, but when, when it opened the, uh, the film market, everything changed back then, right? Um, so all of a sudden, um, the China emerged um, in, in the film network and Asian cinema. Uh, from that moment, um, I, I see um, the crucial turning point was 1992, 1993, especially 1994, when China uh, first uh, allowed the Hollywood films distribution in, in Chinese market. That was uh, the Fugitive by Andrew Davis films uh, with Harrison Ford. It was the first uh, Hollywood films ever uh, distributed in China. And then, and after that, uh, many Asian countries were heading toward China uh, for put, put possible future market um, or um, were outsourcing uh, cheap labors. Um, Korean film studios also in late 1990s to between um, late 1990s to early 2000 used China as a cheap uh, as a source for cheap labors. So and the many Korean films uh, wanted to um, uh, to shoot uh, films or outdoor out, outdoor scenes in in Chinese uh, motion picture studios like in Shanghai and Guangzhou. Um, but by the by the mid 2000 like 2005 or six, uh, China suddenly became the most important market for many Asian countries. Um, so, um, so, um, so no, not just South Korea, but Hong Kong and Taiwan too. Uh, so many Asian countries uh, became heavily reliant on Chinese film market from, uh, from mid-2000 up until 2015 or 2016. So now, uh, ever since um, uh, so-called, what we called a uh, new Cold War uh, film industry structure, and um, the Korean popular culture ban in China in 2015, and the tension between uh, the US and China's uh, film industries and Hollywood uh, love letter ended in around two or three years ago. Now Hollywood is, is moving out from, from China. So um, China doesn't need um, uh, the other Asian country, Asian film industries input or, China, or Hollywood input. So current um, film industry structure, I can say up until 2015, 2016, um, the, the original structure was somehow uh, revived um, plus China. And those structure, those industry network became heavily reliant to the Chinese film market. So China became very important market for most of Asian countries and mm -hmm. the US. But it, it changed completely of the past uh, since let's say uh, 2018, 2019, uh, current Xi Jinping era. Um, so now it's, it's pretty difficult to say that. Uh, on, uh, at this moment, what I can say is uh, South Korea, especially South Korean film industry, um, without um, uh, China's Chinese market, I mean, after losing Chinese market, um, is trying to build a sort of Asian cinema network. Um, so it's very interesting network. It's, it's, uh, it's gonna be Asian cinema network except China and Japan. So South Korea is trying to become a leader of this new uh, Asian cinema network. Um, so uh, let's say it's been about three or four years. Um, South Korean film industry, especially for government sector, has powered money to uh, Southeast Asian countries, mm. including uh, Myanmar, uh, Cambodia, um, and also the Philippines. Uh, and to some extent, uh, Singapore, because Singapore um, has always been a mediator because of the language matters, because South Koreans, normally South Koreans don't speak uh, the, the Southeast Asian local languages. So Singapore became quite important for South Korean uh, film industry or South Korean politicians, uh, I mean, film policy people. They use Singapore um, and Singapore people or Singaporean uh, film producers and executives as a, as a kind of you know, mediator or go between. Um, mm -hmm. So they have been working together closely for, for, the, for the last three or four, I mean, up to five years. Uh, but it's quite difficult, quite challenging matter for South Korea, like what Japan did in the 50s or 60s. South Korea is not part of Southeast Asia, but South Korea is trying to lead uh, the industry in Southeast Asia uh, and want to uh, advance the Southeast Asian market by setting up uh, theaters, movie theaters and the film industries and many South Korean film, in, uh, film uh, uh, studios are co-producing films with Vietnam, Indonesia, and Malaysia. So South Korea is trying to get into that way, trying to uh, get the position of uh, the leaders of Asian cinema, Southeast Asian cinema industry, or ASEAN uh, regions uh, at this moment. 
So things are getting quite interesting ways these days. So I really don't know what is going to happen in the next, but um, but we really have to um, you know keep an eye on the changes happening right now. Um, uh, I teach um, Asian film industries, uh, but every time I teach, I have to update my syllabus completely. But things change so fast, right? So things say fast, so change so fast. Now I mean, the, to teach South Asian film industry, uh, I, I have to uh, you know I have to uh, teach two, three, or uh, up to four weeks on Netflix and OTT. Uh, streaming media's influence in Asian cinema and industry. So, um, yeah, that's uh, that's something I can say at this moment. Well, this, yeah, it's, it kind of reminds me of uh, well, we were doing like an infrastructure media as media thing seminar here. That there's always kind of kind of a path dependency of different uh, la layers of infrastructure or pre-existing network that we could turn turn into different uh, uses for different political or ideological reasons. And we have other questions yep. uh, from many friends in the audiences. Uh, first, uh, we have a question from Joe Dali, who is also our postdoc uh, research fellow here. Thank you for the insightful presentation. I look forward to reading your book. I have a question about the state, pro state private network. Ford Foundation is an example of such network. You clearly stated about the support of a, uh, Asia Foundation as part of the US anti-communism projects. However, was there any evidence showing the in direct or indirect connection, interaction between the US State Department officials and the leader of the AF, Asia Foundation? Uh, yeah, uh, that's a good question. Right. Okay, there was, um, you know, that was my initial question when I began um, you know, working on this project. Uh, because there are some, you know, um, some works done on on USSI's uh, Ford Foundation and Rockefeller Foundations um, to work in Europe and Asia. So I, my initial question was, uh, were there any, you know, closely networked or close cooperation between the uh, you know, Ford Foundation or Rockefeller Foundations or USS, USIS and, and and Asia Foundation? But it was not because simply Asia Foundation was uh, was a CIA institution. So it had to be it had to be uh, it had to it had to be unknown, right? It couldn't be official. But Ford Foundation, Rockefeller, and USI says I mean US uh, Ford Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation is a state uh, network. I mean it's private network and USI is a state uh, state network, a state uh, you know institution and uh, philanthropic. So so USIS uh, was uh, was US State Department um, uh, project and it, it it had to be official. But Asia Foundation had to act as a secret institution, and then in terms of the budget of Asia Foundation was far lower than uh, than other foundations. Uh, it was merely uh, three or four million dollars in each each year, and in in 1963, uh, 1964, around those time, uh, which is um, you know I mean, which is far lower than other institutions. So instead of powering money to um, to each government or um, you know uh, major institutions, Asia Foundation wanted to um, you know to wanted to uh, uh, let's say support individuals and small institutions. So it is a face is 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 a man to man uh, strategy. Uh, so Asia Foundation uh, uh, approached uh, film individual film producers, uh, directors, screenwriters. And intellectuals, largely intellectuals, uh, professors, um, and then an you know, artist, and then support them to study to go to the U.S. and provide them kind of a six-month uh, study, uh, uh, you know, scholarship or one-year study class uh, scholarship or exchange programs. So they helped them, they helped Asia's and intellectuals and artists, um, to, you know, to see uh, see uh, the, how amazing the United States are was around that time. So many of those uh, uh, intellectuals in Asia who got uh, who had uh, support from the uh, uh, you know from the Asia Foundation became uh, pro U.S. figures. Um, they they became quite successful in in their field. Uh, many of uh, you know all the generation uh, prestigious film uh, prestigious prestigious professors at major universities in South Korea. Um, they many of them got uh, support uh, or fund from Asia Foundation. Yes, that's why. So in terms of a film industry project, uh, Asia Foundation didn't have any official uh, collaboration with USIS. 
uh, or other uh, foundations. And Asia Foundation wanted to do it by all, by their own ways. But there was some concern because USIS um, knew about Asia Foundation's presence, and Ford Foundation was also knew about the Asia Foundation's presence. Uh, but they never actually worked together. But they knew each other's their their presence, and there was always a tension between those agents. And those agents were official government agents, but Asia Foundation's agents were uh, largely professors in the United States. UC Berkeley professors or University of Michigan professors or uh, Minnesota professors, they were Asianist. Japan, uh, Japanese history professors or geography professors um, or economics professors. They were professors and uh, writers and journalists. They were the individuals. Well, thank you. Well. It seems that we have this like a really extended network extended into the academia uh, everywhere, including my elevator. Uh, okay, so we have the next question from audience Robert Chen. Uh, mm -hmm. From my understanding, Asian Film Festival was and is always considered an quote unquote official festival in the sense that it is not really a film festival per se, because the, the awards were given evenly among country members. Therefore, it is not like the real international film festivals, such as the Cannes and Venice, Venice International Film Fest, where the real film expert judge and give a, uh, when people give awards. So my question is, is this the re reason that Asian Foundation decides, decided to withdraw its support because it is not a quote unquote professional uh, enough? Good question. Yes. Um, the film festivals around that time, 1950s were actually uh, quite different from those we are familiar with now, right? Um, back in 1950s, film festivals um, was more like a showcase of national cinema. Even Cannes and Venice festivals didn't have what we called uh, film festival uh, programmers and and um, and the creators. So uh, the way film festival worked in 1950s, um, it's, it's more like that. Um, it's more like let's say, on on uh, uh, like Olympic Games. So each participant country sent uh, what it believed to be um, its finest product uh, from a certain country, normally up to four films, and the festival jurors made the final decision. Uh, and this system changed in the 19, late 1960s, 1970s, and then film festivals began adopting like what they say, film programmers and creator system. So, um, so uh, film, ex film, film expert uh, and, and, and journalist, and then, uh, and then uh, SNAP files uh, became part of uh, film festivals. But anyway, uh, Asia film festivals, quite interesting because each year uh, is peripatetic system from city, city to city to country to country each year. So it really depends on host country, where host country was. So for example, Hong Kong and Singapore, uh, there were many uh, British and European and American journalists and critics working in Hong Kong and Singapore around that time, mostly Hong Kong. So Hong Kong and Singapore uh, 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 festivals, those hosting committee, um, they invited uh, so well-known uh, film critics and scholars or well, critics and journalists uh, the, uh, which, you know, European based critics and journalists to the festivals. So it was more a little more professional than, than, than the event um, held in South Korea, Taiwan, uh, and Malaysia, and Philippines. So kind of differences between, uh, between each country. But um, what we can, I can say is it's not in, uh, an international, real international film festival. It's not a nation-based. It's, it's more like kind of, you know, let's say um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an industry summit and public screening was not considered. So um, although the film festival was being held in each country, the, the, uh, the audience in, in that, uh, that particular country was not able to see those films screened during the film festival. So it was kind of festival for and among uh, film industry um, professionals. So the, in the part of the question is, is, it this, is this the, the reason that the Asia Foundation decided to withdraw its support because it is not professional enough? Not quite sure. Uh, Asia Foundation still wanted to provide, still wanted to support uh, Asia Film Festival because they thought Asia Film Festival was useful. Uh, but the real challenging issue was uh, the political changes in, in Asia around that time. It, it made them really challenging and difficult. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, the main reason is, uh, as I think I, told, I mentioned about this earlier, uh, but uh, during that time in late 1950s, um, there were not many South Asian specialists in, in the United States. So not many uh, people actually spoke Southeast Asian languages other than Japanese and, and Mandarin. I mean, they, I mean, there were people who spoke Japanese and Mandarin, but not Southeast Asian languages. And they, were, they didn't understand Southeast Asia fully. Um, uh, and the Robert Bloom, the president of Asia Foundation, was largely European um, uh, you know, policy specialist. He knew Asia a bit, but his understanding of Asian matter, Asian politics was quite you know, slim. And then uh, Charles Tanner and, and the other people, they, they, they didn't know much about Asia. And many of them came from a small town in the United States. They were largely country bump, right? They're country bumpkins. So, so they had never been outside their state, their hometown before coming to Asia, right? So uh, they were born in Iowa, born in you know, Michigan, and born in you know, Ohio. Uh, they grew up there as, as a dedicated Christians and anti-communist. And they, uh, when they got jobs at, uh, at Asia foundations in Asian uh, countries and cities, um, they, they most, for many of them, it was the first time for them to, 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 um, to meet people in Asia. And because they didn't understand Asian language, they wanted to work with people who spoke English. So only the so handproof uh, Asian special hand, handproof uh, film industry people in Asia who spoke English had connect, made connection a network with Asia Foundation. They they got they got beneficial uh, benefit from that because of they spoke English. That was main reason why the Asia Foundation's project actually failed. Mm. For, for those who are who were superior, who are more experienced film producers and and and, uh, and directors, could not communicate with Asia Foundation people because of language barriers. So uh, the people, the ones, uh, the, the the people Asia Foundation chose were less powerful and less prestigious and less competent than other uh, real filmmakers and film specialists around the time. So it was meant to be failed, right? Because <laughs> uh, Asia Foundation chose wrong people. And Nagata Masai was the only one, I think Nagata Masai and, and Ron Ron Show, they were the only people who were actually, you know, experienced and, and had, a, uh, as a cap uh, had a capacity, but they had different ideas of using Asia Foundation. They wanted to use Asia Foundation for their own interest. Mm -hmm. So they survived and they kept going on and, and then moving on, but rest of those Asia Foundation um, network uh, producers and industry people in late 1950s and early 1960s uh, largely disappeared um, uh, in, in each country's industries. That was part of the reason, I think part of the main reason why Asia Foundation stopped um, but supporting um, Asia Film Festival because they, they, they by then they realized they made a mistake. Well, this this line of discussion is so interesting because it kind of reminds me of the parallel development of film industry, cultural policy, and the so-called area studies uh, in the states. Right, that you mentioned is because of the lack of uh, linguistic proficiency in certain areas of Asia that that contribute to this. Um, mistake of choice uh, or wrong choice by the organizers. Of it. This is very interesting because you see really like a different layer of infrastructure is tied into this, sure. this festival structure. Sure. Yeah, and we have actually a question from our post which is highly related to the question about uh, ling ling linguistic barrier uh, from Tang Huiyu, our post up here. Uh, thank you, Sang Jin. This lecture is just wonderful. My question is, uh, doing your research, how do you overcome language barriers yourself as an Asian cinema include, include so many different languages and also archive materials such as uh, local newspapers and so on. So I guess this is like turning the historical language to your own research language in terms of, you know, dealing with languages. Yes, that is, uh, this is excellent point. And then I got uh, the same questions uh, quite many times. Right, because of uh, you can look at my book, and then I, 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 I um, it's, it's like you know, I, um, I do cover whole <laughs> range of countries in in Asia and Southeast Asia, and East and Southeast Asia, uh, excluding India. I didn't touch on India mm. in my book. So, but that is something uh, someone, I mean, someone has to do that. 
uh, because uh, Asia Foundation has, um, I mean, I found a, a box on India. So mm. something probably happened between Asia Foundation and India, Indian cinema. So that should be very extremely interesting uh, research topic. But simply, um, I had no no um, knowledge on Indi Indian cinema, especially for classic era, 1950s, 60s. So I couldn't touch on that, but that, that's uh, put aside. So the problem for language was yes. So um, how I overcame, um, I, 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 I secured enough budget to, uh, to find translators and uh, translators who can translate um, some materials, uh, some crucial materials for me. Uh, thankfully, I, I work in Singapore. Uh, mm -hmm. So Singapore is heart of Southeast Asia. So we have graduate students from uh, Philippines, um, um, Indonesia, uh, and also Vietnam. So thank, uh, thankfully, uh, because of my workplace, I was uh, I was able to find uh, the graduate student, um, and then and then a research fellow, a research assistant uh, who uh, were able to help me uh, translate um, uh, the newspaper articles and some important um, materials. Uh, but at the same time, um, it's not thankfully, but due to the colonial legacy, the Burma, uh, especially Burma in Hong Kong, right? And also Singapore too, and Malaya too. Many of those documents were actually, they, uh, they kept both English version and, 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 and local languages. And they also had English language newspapers regularly published uh, uh, very exciting, interesting articles and, news, and, and the news, and the news uh, items. So I was able to uh, use that. Uh, and also secondary, uh, uh, second -hand materials and the secondary materials was there were also quite a number of books and articles written by uh, the, the, the European and British scholars on Burma, uh, I mean, Myanmar, uh, Burma uh, and Ceylon. Um, you know, now we call it you know, Sri Lanka. So those countries, yes, uh, there, are, um, there are tons of uh, important works uh, already done by uh, European and British uh, scholars and historians. So I was able to, I mean, it, it took lots of times and energies to, to read uh, through those, but yes, there are certain, um, the Europe, my, my most challenging mission was not just reading and reading and translating things, but to make connections of all those documents and, 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 and fragmented histories. That was the most challenging. For example, uh, I just, you know, um, uh, in, in my presentation today, so I explained about, you know, uh, uh, I introduced uh, uh, a number of people, Charles Tanner and Robert Bloom and Alan, you know, Alan Ballantyne uh, and Chang Kuo Xin uh, and, and so on. Um, so if you read my book, uh, you see lots of people, lots of names coming up uh, in my book. But uh, it's very difficult to find, uh, you know, personal information about those people because they are not famous ones. They are not uh, important people in history. They were just minor players in history, right? In part of the history. So it's pretty, it's extremely, it was extremely challenging to, to find more information about those people. So I had to visit multiple different archives and also had to use human connections. So uh, the person who really helped me was the daughter of Charles Tanner, the Bobby Tanner. So she's, uh, she's almost nine years old. Uh, she lives in, uh, in Oxnard, uh, California. Uh, but she, uh, I don't know about her now, right now, but back then, uh, four or five, five or six years ago, she was very healthy. And she still had uh, fresh memories of her, of her late father. And then she also had memories of her father's friend um, who, are, who also worked for Asia Foundation. So uh, she, uh, she shared her, um, her knowledge, memories, and her um, you know, photos and, and uh, personal record of her dad, her, her, her late, late dad. So I was able to navigate some of those. So uh, for me, um, the most challenging part, as I told you, it was making connections, not about translations. Mm -hmm. That's a challenging part too, but um, I, I could do that uh, with, uh, with, with uh, you know, others, others' help, but making network was, the most challenging. So it took uh, several years to actually to fully grasp uh, the network. Okay. Yeah, I, I echo this this dif difficulty of locating uh, or reconstructing the subject media network uh, for my own research too. Like when I was looking at the propaganda media archive, uh, it's always hard to uh, locate or identify so-called individual artists, so to speak, or cinematographers. And I. I totally thank thanks Hui for for asking this question. That's most of my own 
question. Oh, I, by the way, I saw a box of Asia Foundations, uh, I mean, the Committee for a Free Europe, a uh, Free Asia, their, um, their box uh, in Taiwan project. So that box I didn't touch on. So if anyone want to, probably someone had already used that, maybe. Yeah, I think so. No, that that box I didn't touch on. So okay, I'll I'll look into that boxes. <laughs> when next time I'm revisiting the Hoover Institute. Uh, okay, so we have a question from oh yeah Zongyi, our uh, uh, assistant here. Thank you, Songjin, for your lecture. I noticed that uh, the newest 35 um, mm camera that at that time used in Sun TV na, the Thai, the Thai film, I believe, and the Michel camera awards for the technical step. Uh, except for funding, was there any technical or cinema producing experience sharing from Hollywood to Asian cinema through the channel of uh, FPA? I think this is an interesting question uh, yeah. concerning the, share, the infrastructure of information sharing sure. on the level of technology, technology and material. Materiality. Well, in a sense, like a materiality. Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have a lot to say about this, but anyway, but yes, thank you for asking this question. Um, so, yes, um, the, uh, the, the fascinating thing about uh, the uh, Southeast Asian Film Festival uh, is every time, every, every time uh, the FPA who's, uh, you know, a certain country or city who's film, fest film festival, uh, there was at least one or two uh, extensive meeting or, or sharing sessions about the latest technology of, uh, of filmmaking. Mm -hmm. Because all those uh, executives of uh, Asian film industry around that time were eager to learn about the new technologies, especially for Eastman color photography. There were no information whatsoever for many countries in South Korea and Taiwan. Uh, I, I remember uh, sort of those debate between Japan, South Korea and Taiwan uh, of, of co-producing things, but Taiwan uh, and South Korea and Hong Kong, their producers, directors, they wanted to, to learn how to shoot Eastman color film. Mm. It was a big challenge. And also, um, and the sound issues, synchronization, um, and, um, and, uh, and, and also uh, the more, let's say, Hollywood style script writing or dialogue composing. So lots of those issues that the people discuss a lot and uh, because uh, although um, you know Hollywood involved this to some extent, Hollywood was too far from Asia and then too big for Asian film uh, industry people's perspective around that time, right? Uh, you know, suppose you were working in, in, in Taiwan film industry in the 50s. Um, main, of course, you can, you, you, got, you can talk about Hollywood, I mean, but, but Hollywood was too far and too big and then too, too grand to, uh, to approach. So instead, they wanted to learn from more adjacent neighbor, Japan. Mm. So Japan was more important for and valuable for uh, many Asian film industry uh, people around that time. So they wanted to learn from Japan. But when they um, had, had an interview with local newspaper, they never mentioned about Japan because that was very, uh, still quite, uh, you know, um, controversial issues or is what is so, they never mentioned about Japan's help or Japan network, but within the network of FPA and film festival, they wanted, they all wanted to work with Japan. They all wanted to learn from Japan, Japanese technology. Uh, and the Japan um, uh, was also quite active uh, on, on not sharing, but spreading the Japanese influence again to Southeast Asia and Asian countries. They were quite happy, especially for Naruto Masaichi. Uh, he was quite happy to, to regain his power in Southeast Asia, in Asia, uh, after um, you know, the, uh, the surrender to the Allies in 1945. So, so that, that actually happened, right? And also, um, but Japan was not the only uh, major film industry around that time, Philippines. Unlike today, right? 1950s, Philippine, uh, the Philippines film industry was second to Japan in Asia. It was quite active, vibrant. And also there were five major studios in Philippines in the 1950s. And each studio turned out uh, between 50 and 70 films each, uh, you know, each year. That was quite, quite you know, productive. So uh, Philippines was also quite ahead of other Asian countries. So Philippines also wanted to uh, provide some grant or some help for Asian film industry peoples, especially the ones in Southeast Asia. 
So Philippines and Japan, they they were uh, they acted as um, as as um, as like a, like like brothers, big brothers in Asian film industry. So that actually happened um, that going on that happened in 1950s, especially uh, uh, mid to late 1950s. From from 1960s and on, they stopped uh, communicating with Japan uh, because South Korea uh, there were there was there's a coup uh, by President President Park Chung Hee, and then and the military government of the dictatorship um, uh, started from 1962 and lasted about two decades. And Taiwan also had a kind of same issue, similar issues. So nationalistic sentiment um, emerged in the early 1960s in many Asian countries. Um, so they cut ties with Japan. And many film producers around the time also cut ties. They stopped um, communicating with Japan uh, officially. But, but unofficially, they still wanted to, to do that. And they, um, uh, whenever they uh, visited Japan or Tokyo, uh, they purchased uh, uh, books on modern technology and brought the books back to their home country and translated them and then used them as, as manuals. So still Japan helped. Uh, and then the 35 millimeter camera was a dream. It was just a dream for many Asian filmmakers, as I told you in the 1950s, Micha camera was the ultimate dream because uh, you know, Gone with the Wind was shot with Michel and all those Hollywood blockbuster uh, splendid pictures were um, you know, shot by Michel 35 a camera. So it was more like kind of, you know, the tool that could bring Hollywood quality uh, to Asian cinema. So uh, Mitchell was, was used um, as, as a major um, uh, award and major award to attract uh, Asian filmmakers. Well, this is- and, well, yes. so One more stop, one more no, stop. Course, uh, yeah. Hollywood. Uh, Asia Foundation brought Hollywood screenwriter, Winston Miller mm -hmm. to Daiye Studio, because they thought Daiye Studio in Japan was the most advanced uh, film industry or advanced studio. So uh, what they thought, I mean, Asia Foundation people, they thought Hollywood was the pantheon of filmmaking. So they, they thought if Japan learned from, from, from Hollywood, uh, Japan film industry could advance to the Western world, right? That's, that's what they thought. So they invited uh, Winston Miller, the Hollywood scriptwriter, and then uh, provided enough money to spend one month at IA studio in Japan. So Winston Miller tried to help, but as I told, um, you know, returned to the language issues because of language barriers, they were not a they were actually not able to work together. And the Winston Miller uh, disappointed um, if they stopped working together. So uh, there was some effort um, Asia Foundation made to bring Hollywood uh, specialists to, to Asia, um, but it didn't work out. Well, thank you. Uh, I, I really love this line of discussion because I was also about to ask a very similar question uh, because it kind of, I couldn't help but uh, think of the uh, Singaporean base at Lok Wen Tau and the Cathay organization. And it's and Lok Wen Tau's premature plan to launch another anti-communist film studio in Taiwan uh, oh, before he died in Taiwan, actually. 64. Yeah, crash. yeah, it's a tragic air crash in Taichung, Taiwan, and uh, and that, and the whole issue was also hinged upon this creating this technological sublime or technological splendor through uh, uh, not not from from a uh, base in Singapore producing Hong Kong, but now planning to do it again or expanded it in Taiwan, but that was that fell through with, uh, in 1964 with the uh, air crash. But it, I couldn't help but linking uh, this, this Hollywood feel, Hollywood feeling uh, related to the technicity of cinema. Yeah, sure, sure, yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so I love, really love you. And we have one more question. We are almost reaching, uh, this reached, reaching the end of the Q&A session. They're really rich and wonderful. Uh, one, one more question from the audience. Uh, thank you for your wonderful speech and the. Uh, uh, sorry, another. Wealth of international data analysis, you mentioned that you had contact with the descendants of the film, or uh, the daughter of the, the, the practitioners involved in that at the time. Do you also contact or plan to contact the practitioner, practitioners who still dominate the country's film, in, film industry or culture now to understand their experience and perspective in different eras? Uh, I don't know, yeah. yeah. Obviously, yes, but, but, but uh, they all died. <laughs> okay. Right, because of the subject I, I, I handled, uh, uh, I dealt with is 1950s and 60s. 
for those practitioners are, I mean, the, the last one, the last one standing was actually London Show, who died in 2014. So, uh, but I tried, <laughs> I initially tried to, to meet London Show in 2011, um, but I, uh, I emailed <laughs> to the, 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 you know, the, the, the Show Brothers and then uh, never responded. Um, that's quite understandable. Uh, so London Show was the, the last one survived. Uh, mm -hmm. He passed away, uh, I think he passed away 2014, 2015, around five or six years ago. So he was the last one um, uh, remained and rest of them were all passed away. Um, so uh, Charles Tanner's daughter was the, was the one uh, I was able to connect. Um, she was almost nine years old back then. Um, but yeah, uh, but for my, my second project, um, the second book I'm working on, Hong Kong, South Korea uh, Connection, um, I did initial research uh, in Hong Kong in 20, 2007, 2008. Uh, uh, and then Hong Kong Film Archive was really helpful. Um, so Hong Kong Film Archive helped me to meet uh, Hong Kong filmmakers, uh, a series of Hong Kong filmmakers who worked in, uh, in, 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 in South Korea um, and made um, uh, you know, directed co-production films between South Korea and Hong Kong during the 50s and 60s. So luckily, I, I, I have that interviews in my, in my computer and they all passed away. Uh, so I was lucky to, to move earlier. So I have, I have some information um, by them, um, but yes, this is a, it's a, it's a pity. It's, um, it's, uh, it's a problem for working on um, histories longer than six or seven years. And many of them, yeah, they, they pass away. Yeah, I, I think for those of us who do archival or interview relate, uh, interview or archival based research, this is just an issue. We just need to be yeah. fast. Yeah, we have fast. to be creative and imaginative. <laughs> yeah. Okay, oh, we have a last question. Oh, uh, from our mutual friend, uh, Ting Wu. Hi, Ting Wu. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I can say hi and turn up. Uh, your screen. Uh, greetings from Ting Wu. Thank you, Sanjin, for your insightful works and talk. Many of my questions were answered, just as exciting and insightful answers. So just send in my, well, best name. <laughs> and thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you, too. Yeah, yeah. Right. I guess we are almost reaching the, uh, the end of the, the, the Q&A session. And I, I, I find this line of different lines of discussion super helpful. And uh, if there are no other uh, questions from the audience. Uh, I am also closing this Q and A session, and I want to also took this this chance and this wonderful two and a half hour of afternoon uh, with Sanjin online, uh, connecting Taiwan and Singapore, uh, another network here. <laughs> and uh, I want to, uh, uh, for logistic reason, I I would uh, I am inviting uh, people and friends in the audience or some of my students here to. Show to show your screen and to thank our speaker today so that we can take a screenshot. So as a proof, we did this. <laughs> yeah, and thank you again for, for this wonderful sharing. And I have a lot, some question, but I think I'll just ask you uh, through yeah, sure. email. Uh, later, we have other conversation uh, in the yeah. future, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, meet. okay. Should I would meet. invite. Yeah, we should meet in Singapore or Taiwan. Yeah, and then we see face face each other and they share the food and then share the drinks and then that's something I really want. <laughs> totally, uh, the, well, the kaya toast comes into my mind, right? Right away. Ah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Perfect. yeah. Uh, I will invite everyone here in the Zoom, still in the Zoom, uh, showing your face and uh, give, let's give a, 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 well, a round of applause to our speaker, Sanjin, uh, Sanjin Lee, Dr. Sanjin Lee today. And thank you for this wonderful talk. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and can we, can we show show some faces here so we can take a quick screenshot together, just quickly for us to uh, you know as a for logistics reason. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, don't you can you help us with the uh, with a screenshot? Hello. <laughs> you see, see some friends here. <laughs> okay, I guess we are done here. All right, all right, and uh, I think time is perfect, perfectly um, right on time. And thank you, Sanjit, for uh, 
sharing your valuable uh, research experiences. And I hope uh, the, as I told you, the book uh, is under the Chinese version, traditional Chinese version of the book is underway. And I hopefully to get the completed translation uh, script uh, to the publisher review very soon. And I'll keep you posted. And hopefully uh, the Korean version, as you said, would come out about the same time. <laughs> Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much for inviting me uh, over. And then I really enjoyed my lecture and then the Q&A, and then I got really good questions for the floor. So I'm very happy. It's a, it's a kind of perfect way to, to begin uh, a new year. Yeah, okay. Happy new year. And uh, I'll see you, that's it, be in contact soon, okay? Happy new year. Yeah, happy new year. Yeah, bye-bye everyone. Bye.